So besides Brazil, here's another picture that gives us an illustration of keeping an eternal perspective in this temporary world. This is actually the center of the cemetery out at St. Joseph's Abbey out on River Road. If you've never been there, I would recommend it. Uh, public can go there. You don't have to be Catholic to go there. I go there quite often. Um, I don't go to Mass or anything, but I go out to the, uh, to the grounds, walk around. It's gorgeous. This is the center of the cemetery. That's actually one of the oldest oak trees in Louisiana. It's absolutely magnificent. Uh, next slide. And, of course, you walk around the cemetery, and, of course, it's a cemetery. There's lots of headstones, gravestones with people's names on it. And, um, you know, I know it sounds a little morbid, but I would highly recommend visiting a cemetery every now and then. Just because. Not because you have a funeral to go to or something like this, but it is a practice that <laughs> hits you upside the head with keeping an eternal perspective in this temporary world, doesn't it? Um, and so today, we're going to go into a few different texts, very simple texts from the New Testament that help us have this perspective, keeping an eternal perspective in this temporary world. Now, we're going to work backwards. We're going to start with the temporary world and get to the eternal perspective. So first, let's talk about some temporary realities of this world and the frustrations it can bring. I thought of three. How about this? I wish these were a little bit bigger, but we can see them. Does this frustrate you? Do these things bring frustration to the world? Are they temporary? Social media, nightly news, 24-hour news circles, uh, blogs, podcasts, all helpful in a number of ways, but also pretty frustrating in a number of ways too, and certainly temporary. We live in an age of dizzying, unprecedented amount of information each day. Opinions rage, don't they? Conflicts are daily through information. Relationships are severed due to varying opinions and, and hate and disagreement. Confusions are like never before about important things like truths, values, and morals. I just read this this morning. According to a report by the University of California, San Diego, the average American consumes about 34 gigabytes of data and information every day. That is estimated to be the equivalent of 100,000 words heard or read, or of course I guess you could say watched, every day. 100,000. That is about as many words are, are as in J.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit. That's how much information is going through your eyes and in your mind every day, like reading The Hobbit every single day. That's a lot of information to process, confusion to struggle with, and stress that can come from it. All right, how about number two? Self-centeredness. Others' self-centeredness, your self-centeredness, do you frustrate you? <laughs> Amen to that. I know I frustrate people. People frustrate me, and I frustrate myself. Why self-centeredness? You know, you go back to the fall. There's a lot you could say about what happened in the fall and why and the effects of it. But essentially this, Satan tempted Adam and Eve to live for themselves. You don't need God. You can be your own God. You can live life according to how you want to do it. Your will be done, not God's. Self-centeredness. And that's one of the things we are released from or redeemed from in the gospel, right? Get off yourself and on to others through Christ, who did exactly that. I like to say that all sin 
is either some form of self-exaltation about putting yourself up on a pedestal, my will be done. All sin is either something about you exalting yourself or you protecting yourself. Reflect on that. And then number three, death. Our life on earth is temporary. The CDC says that we're living longer than ever now. And that's a good thing in a number of ways. Of course, it brings frustrating things too, doesn't it? Long-term care and whatnot. CDC says we're averaging around 82 years now, the life expectancy. That's longer than ever before. But in perspective, it's still pretty short, isn't it? Death is a reality no one can escape. It's a reality no one can completely predict. When's it going to happen? We have those fears, right? Kind of there's a little fear of what's on the other side and what are, what's going to happen to those who are left behind. And then, of course, you got this amazing contrast in Scripture between the beautiful reality of heaven and the wretched reality of hell. Death is temporary, but of course has eternal consequences. So when we think about these things that are temporary in this world and that can bring us frustration or anxiety, what do we Christians need to do in a world that is unavoidably temporary and increasingly frustrating? What should we do? Well, there's a number of things, of course, but today I'm going to focus on one thing. I think we need to take hold of the eternal perspective the Bible gives us. Take hold of the eternal perspective the Bible gives us. We're going to look at two passages today. And both of them, as I said in in the intro, they're both very simple. uh, Profound, but simple. In other words, there's not a lot of deep exegesis we have to do. There's not a lot of deep theological terms. They're pretty simple and easy to understand. But that's part of the beauty of them. So let's go there now. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to look at just verses 16 through 18. Let me read that for us. Here's Paul writing to the Corinthian church. Maybe he's writing to North Shore Bible Church. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. So let me give us a little context here. Um, Listen to these facts that Christian sociologist Rodney Stark tells us about the living conditions they were wrestling with at Colossae. All right, so there's a lot of political situations, cultural situations, of course, but particularly some physical situations they were really struggling with in terms of um, suffering and death. That they were these light momentary afflictions. Afflictions there are primarily physical sufferings. Here's what Stark says is going on back then in the first century. Sanitation was horrendous. There was no soap. Water supply was always polluted and full of disease. Sewers were most often open ditches. There were no antibiotics. Very little knowledge of germs. Constant illness, physical affliction, and early death was part of the common daily life for the early church. Mortality rates were very high. Life expectancy from birth to death was usually less than 30 years, sometimes less. Infant mortality was very high, as much as 50%. Not to mention how many mothers also died in childbearing. So thankfully, our physical health situation today is much better, right? 
Praise God for that. However, corrupt politics, agendaized media, and constant material temptations hound us today, don't they? I think these realities right here make these passages, these verses we're going to look at, really relevant for us in keeping an eternal perspective. So look at verse 16. Paul says, Though our outer self is wasting away. It's a picture of the process of continual decay of our physical bodies. Facts are facts, right? Though our outer self is wasting away. So that's happening. But it says, though, though that's happening, he's about to say something else that balances it out. And that next thing he says is, our inner self is being renewed day by day. What is that? That's a picture of the continual process of God's work through the Holy Spirit in our hearts and on our minds. Though our bodies are decaying and wasting away and in a sense losing life, our inner selves through the gospel, through the word, through our relationship with Christ, with one another, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Though your physical life is dying more and more, your inner life is being alive more and more. Now obviously Paul is trying to be encouraging here. He's showing us that though the body is valuable, it's not evil, nevertheless, it will fall apart and eventually die. But the inner man has maybe even a higher value, is actually increasing in vitality, and is eternal. And he continues this in verse 17. He tells them two additional facts to be encouraged by. Number one, The sufferings these Christians are going through are only temporary. I don't know about you. Um, We all go through sufferings emotionally, mentally, physically, or even just struggling with things going on in the world. But remember, the things you're going through are temporary. They're temporary until your life ends or until the Lord comes back. And then secondly, Paul tells us in verse 17 that... God is watching their endurance and their sufferings and will be rewarded. Actually, literally, it says that the rewards will be in out of proportion to the affliction. The comfort, the presence you're going to get with God in eternity is out of proportion to the affliction. That's good news. I'm glad for that. And how about this term, the eternal weight of glory? It's gaining for you this eternal weight of glory. Of course, it's it's an indication of what your life's going to be like in glory, in heaven. It's going to be much better than here. No more sin, no more mourning, no more corruption, no more stress or sin or relational discord or whatever else you want to add. But it's also this idea that this is so cool that we're going to see God for what he really is, and we're going to see how valuable it is to have God in our lives. This eternal weight of glory, it's going to be awesome to see what our new life is going to be like and what God is like without sin and without the problems of the world. And then verse 18, I think this is the most important verse of our A couple of verses here we're looking at, 2 Corinthians. Verses 16 and 17 are a result of what somebody does in verse 18. All right, let me say that again. What we just looked at, verses 16 and 17, are the result of someone who does verse 18. So if you want 16 and 17 to be true for you, do verse 18. So what does verse 18 say? It literally says, concentrate your attention on... We should concentrate our attention on. On what? On the things that are unseen, not the things that are seen. He says the seen things are transient. In other words, like smoke, like vapor. They come and go quickly. But the things that are unseen are eternal. In other words, very eternal. 
As, as smoke or vapor goes by quick, it's the exact opposite. It, they're going to go on for a long time. Well, that begs the question, Paul, what are the things you're talking about? And he seems to be talking about things of value, right? It's not just a time stamp. He's not just talking about facts. You know, these glasses are temporary. Uh, you know, your heart is forever. He's not just talking about time stamp. He's trying to indicate value, where we should be focusing our attention and our hope on. So he says we should be focusing on things unseen, not things that are seen. So how about things that are seen? What would those be? I think according to Paul, when I look at his other things he says in the scriptures, he's talking about the things that the world values or the world's system of values. You name it. Here's a few. Power. Sufferings. Possessions. Pleasures. Family heritage. How much you know. How, much, how smart you are. How knowledgeable you are. Your status. Etc. These things are man-produced. Man-exalting things. And have a short shelf life. On the other hand, the things that are unseen, what are they? They are the things that the kingdom of God and Jesus values. Here's some examples of those. How about hope? Hope is an unseen thing, but is hope powerful? What are you hoping in? Where's your hope in this life? What carries you through your sufferings? That's of a lot of value. If you, if you walked over to Walmart and were to buy hope off the shelf, how much would you pay? How about character? We're all growing in that, right? We all struggle with having character traits that are good and bad, and God's working on us and getting us to be more and more like Christ. Character is something God really values. That's something that's of eternal value that we should be focusing on. Uh, here's another one we already said. Other-centeredness. Whew! That's a good one. We like that sometimes, and sometimes we don't like that. I want my will to be done sometimes. <laughs> Thinking about the good of others. Uh, and then, of course, another one is, how about this one? Fellowship with God. Think about that. You have, through your faith in Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian here this morning, you have a relationship with the one and only true God of the universe. Actually, fellowship, it's, it's koinonia, it's, it's, it's closeness, close-knitness together. That's amazing. So these things are spirit-produced, God-exalting things, and they're very high in value. So there's 2 Corinthians 4. Now, if you, the longer you read Scripture, the more and more you see that uh, the authors say similar things in different ways, in different books. Flip over to Colossians 3 with me. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. Um, by the way, I would uh, encourage you, I encourage first service. If you're looking for a quick, nothing should be quick, but if you're looking for a quick, way to understand what does the Christian life look like? What should I look like as a Christian? What does the Christian life mean? Read Colossians 3. Colossians 3 is a good one chapter um, excerpt of what it means to be a Christian. So read the rest of the chapter this, uh, today, but we're just going to focus on verses 1 through 3 this morning. All right, let me read it for us. If then you have been raised with Christ, <clears throat> seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now a little context here. Um, Paul is dealing in some of his churches, and Colossians is one, with what are called Jewish mystics. And these are people that often were Jewish in background, um, but really advocated that 
if you want closeness with God, you need to have all sorts of mystical experiences with him. Sounds familiar today? We've heard of that today, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel or, or other uh, false teachings that you, in order to feel close with God or have close, you've got to have these amazing, I'm not against ex- experiences. We just had a great worship time together, didn't we? Amen. But when you're focusing on the experiences rather than the truth, that can be misleading. So what Paul's really trying to argue here is that what you need, all you need to have good spiritual life and closeness with God is one thing, Christ alone. Jesus is enough. You could say is the banner over the book of Colossians. So Paul says in verse 1, he asks a rhetorical question. If you have been raised with Christ, it's really rhetorical meant to have this answer Yes, I have been raised with Christ, or yes, I will raise one day because of my faith in Christ, because Jesus rose from the dead. If you're a Christian, it's a promise that you're going to raise from the dead. So it's meant to be kind of a confirmation. If you're really a Christian, and you're union with Christ, if that's so, what should you do? And he tells them that they are to seek the things that are above That word seek in Greek has this idea of desire and continual habit. So you should have the desire to make a continual habit of doing this. You should have a desire, a desire. You should want this. You should want to make a continual habit of seeking the things that are above. Seek what? Heavenly truths that come from Christ. Things that are of most value. Things that are of eternal value. Similar to uh, 2 Corinthians 4, he said, set your minds on. Set your minds on. Now notice, this is interesting. Notice the focus on thinking. Remember, all these spiritual experiences, those were just emotions and experiences. Paul says, focus your minds on. And I think he says this because of this. When you think about thinking biblically, thinking affects our emotions. And our thinking and our emotions affect our actions, right? How you think about something, good or bad, will make your heart feel certain things, good or bad. And how you think and how you feel will make you act in certain ways, good or bad. So it all starts with our thinking. Set your minds on. And he says, if you read the rest of the chapter today, you'll see in verses 9, 5 through 9 and 12 through 17, he actually tells us some examples of what are the things of earth and what are the things above. When you read for, uh, verses nine, 5 through 9, you'll see a common theme. These are the things of earth. You'll see a common theme of just how self-centered they are. Our lusts, our pride, our boastful pride of life. You'll see a common idea in these, these, all the words he'll use, it's self-centeredness. It's all about you. Then in verses 12 through 17, he talks about the things that are above. Praise God, he gives us some samples. You'll notice in those words... In those terms he uses, you'll notice the common theme that they are things that Christ exemplified. Interesting. So as we have faith in Jesus Christ, as we're growing as Christians, what are we doing? Hopefully, we are getting off of ourselves more, becoming less and less like me, (laughs) and more and more like Jesus. And he says literally, for you have died. What does that mean? I'm not dead yet. For you have died. He's talking about when you come to faith in Christ, your old sinful self, your old man, your old inner self that controlled you, your sinful self that controlled who you were, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions, that is dead now. You have a new master living inside of you, the Holy Spirit. You will now have new affections, 
new perspectives, new priorities, because Christ is in you. And then verse 3, he also says, now your life is hidden with Christ. Kind of a strange term. What does Paul mean there? It kind of has two aspects to it. One is ownership. You are both owned and protected by Christ now. How cool is that? You are owned and protected by Christ now. If you are genuinely saved and you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you have a new owner and a good one. And then secondly, identity. You're hidden with Christ. This is the way you should think of yourself because this is how God sees you now. You are now God. You are hidden with Christ in God. If you could see with x-ray vision, you could see that God loves you and is totally protecting you and that now you are hidden with God in Christ. That's who you are now. It's this idea of ownership and identity. Now, we've just looked at some really good concepts from the scriptures. Divine, authoritative revelation from God himself written to us. That's amazing. But it's also really helpful, if you're like me, to have some practical advice about how to apply these biblical truths to my life. So I want to end with four that I came up with for us today. Because it's really good to hear these ideas, right? These biblical truths about having an eternal perspective in a temporary world. But what are some things I can do, some practices I can do to uh, help me do it? All right, here's four. Number one, hold things loosely. I want you to do this with me. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or say anything. But um, All right. Take your, your hand and clinch it. Go ahead and do that right now. Clinch it. All right. Hold it tight. Hold it tight. And then let it go. What are some things that you hold tight to that you have a hard time letting go? Um... Things you hear on social media, things going on around the world, things going on in your job or in your family. Not that we sweep these things under the carpet and avoid them. That doesn't work, does it? Sometimes you have to deal with stressful, tough things. But I like that picture of things that are held tightly, that are bringing you stress, or or things that you're not letting go, like you want control, and you're doing this, If we live in a temporary world and we're supposed to have eternal perspective, let some things go, man. (laughs) Hold it loosely. Hold it in perspective. There's one. Number two, remind, uh, remind yourself of the scriptures. We just looked at two texts today. Those are good ones to remember. Let me read two more that are good ones to remember. Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. I live in Abita Springs. I'm an American. That's my citizenship. That's my address. But really, right now and forever, My real address as a Christian and your real address and citizenship is in heaven. You're a citizen of heaven right now. And you're not there yet. It's already reserved for you. Amen. How about this one? 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. That means kind of set your affection on. Make a priority of. Like, love it. Like, this is, I'm living for this. Okay? Don't live for the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, 
the desires of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And here it is, verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God, he abides forever. 2,000 years ago, what a word for us today. All right, number, two, number three, serve others. In a world that's frustrating and temporary, how to have an eternal perspective? Serve others like Jesus did. Listen to this little bit of wisdom from Isaiah 58. If things in the world depress you or give you anxiety, listen to what Isaiah 58 tells us to do about that. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom will be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your weak bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Interesting. If things depress you in this world, make you anxious, Isaiah 58 says, go serve other people. 1 Peter 4.19 Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to the faithful creator while continuing to do good. So as you're wrestling through this world or you're experiencing suffering, which... Peter, Peter was written to a, a bunch of Christians who were dealing with severe suffering. He's saying, entrust yourself to God in this world. Entrust yourself to God as you're walking with this world. And do what? Through your sufferings, through your struggles in this world, continue to do good. Don't go hide under a rock. Continue to do good. Continue to serve others. And then finally, maybe one of my favorite ones, I've said this before, 99.9%. All right, what do I mean by that? What, do, what does this has to do with keeping an eternal perspective in a temporary world? Whether you're a Christian or not, if you're not a Christian, this is not good news. If you are a Christian, this is good news. Either way, this is radical news. 99.9% .9 of your existence as a human happens after you die. Actually, if you really want to be technically correct, 99.9999999% of your existence as a human, because humans live forever. We die, this, this life we live is temporary, but we're going to live forever. Hell or heaven according to the divine scriptures. 99.9%. .9 so hang in there. This world we're living in is only 1% of your existence. Now hopefully you're a Christian. And as a Christian, we have this hope of glory, which is going to be far outweigh anything we experience here. There's going to be no more sickness, no more sin, no more sadness, no more corrupt elections. No more whatever, terrible bosses. No more disobedient children. No more bad parents. No more car accidents. Nothing. 99.9% .9 of your existence is going to be in perfect glory. So hold things loosely. Yes, we live in a world that is unavoidably temporary and increasingly frustrating. However, this is nothing new. Christians have wrestled with this truth for centuries. Join the bus. May God use this sermon and these inspired texts we looked at today to help you endure for our church's good, for your family's good, and in the end, most of all, for God's glory. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, it's easy for you to have an eternal perspective. You are eternal. Thank you that you've given us the word of God. Thank you you've given us our salvation. And thank you you've given us the Holy Spirit so that we can now also think eternally. But we sometimes struggle with that, God. We struggle with questions that we have for you about life and situations. Sometimes we just get caught up in our own selfishness or, or the news and, and uh, are stressed out and can't sleep at night. Help us, Lord, to um, hold things loosely. Help us to remember the scriptures. Help us to serve others. And help us to remember that 99.9% of our life will be spent in glory with you, where everything will be perfect. Until that time comes, Lord, give us strength to endure this world, to be lights to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ to our family members and to our workplaces and and to Brazil and to Africa and wherever. Jesus, thank you that you love us. Thank you that we can love one another and love you because of that. So we ask these things, that you'd grant them to us according to your will. And in Jesus' name we pray together as a church family. Amen.